our oceans play a very important role in cycling and absorbing carbon, but our oceans are unproductive and they're not absorbing as much as they can. So just stepping back a little bit more, how about at a macro level talking about kind of CO2 emissions? And I mean, it's a big number to talk about kind of how much we, we put out there, you know, annually. Why do you think this is such a hard kind of number to quantify? I mean, even if it was just started at a macro level. Yeah. So the studies that I have seen say that globally, we emit about 40 gigatons of CO2. Um, there are different numbers. So for example, Nick, you know, when we had a conversation, you mentioned 50 and with the CO2 equivalent, including methane and other gases, it could very well be 50. So methane is a greenhouse gas similar to carbon dioxide, but methane is um, 80 times more potent than CO2. And then there's nitrous oxide. And then there's all these other types of greenhouse gases. Um, you know, nitrous oxide is 300 times more potent. There are greenhouse gases that are 16,000 times more potent than CO2. Um, thankfully, they make up a small amount of greenhouse yeah. gases emitted, but they're there. And, um, I, and so I know so my understanding is CO2 is more abundant and, and it hangs out longer versus methane. Yeah, way more potent, but it's usually, it's not, it doesn't hang out in our atmosphere as long. Correct. The number that I've heard is around 10 years. And, you know, just kind of funny side note, there's a lot of talk about carbon offsets, but now people are starting to talk about methane offsets and methane credits as well. Um, so just kind of like a, a fun tip there. But yeah, you know, 40 gigatons of CO2. Most people have never had to encounter that uh, metric. I can't even comprehend what that looks like. It's right. like trying to comprehend like the size of space. It's I, my brain can't. It's too big. Exactly. <laughs> it's It's so big. And there's very few things in our lives that reach that type of scale. And, you know, we weren't always emitting 40 gigatons, but with the increase in population, the increase in consumption, the increase in the need for energy, whether it's just, you know, our digital, uh, our digital life, uh, you know, Web3, all those different things. We use up a lot of energy and most of our energy comes from fossil fuels. So as the years went on, we, you know, added more and more to the atmosphere. And so currently we're at around 40 gigatons and we may grow this year as well. We're not at peak emissions yet. No, we're still going. Yeah. We we're haven't still, put a dent in the curve yet. No. The interesting thing is, so 40 gigatons, about 20 gigatons is naturally absorbed by our planet, by our land and our oceans. And then mm -hmm. the excess 20 gigatons goes into the atmosphere and it accumulates year over year, right? Year over year, we're producing 40 gigatons. Our planet is not developing new ways to absorb CO2. In fact, um, our oceans play a very important role in cycling and absorbing carbon, but our oceans are unproductive and they're not absorbing as much as they can. So we're you know, putting in more and more, it's accumulating in the atmosphere. And another key number to note, Nick, is uh, currently in February, we were at 421 parts per million of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. It's not complicated. Parts per million is an expression of concentration. But the important thing is that for the last few hundred years, we were always below 300 parts per million. Mm -hmm. And because of human activity, we are now at 420 parts per million or 421 parts per million. And that doesn't mean a lot until we add in the context of um, the experts say that if we surpass 450 parts per million, we surpass the 1.5 degrees Celsius target and we need to be at or below 350 parts per million. So let's just take a pause, right? We're at 421 today. If we surpass 450, we're in big, big trouble. We need to be at 350. So everyone's probably heard about net zero in some form of context. Companies are setting net zero targets, cities, countries um, for like 2040, 2050. What that means is, you know, we're at 421 today. Maybe if we're net zero by 2040, we might be around like 440 
parts per million? I don't know. You know, maybe mix in some carbon removal. Um, so we're at 440. We're still dangerously close to 450 and nowhere near 350 parts per million, which is why carbon removal is a really important piece of the equation and something that we need to invest in and really figure out how to scale quickly because we don't have a lot of time and we have a huge amount of mass of CO2 to move into uh, from the, it's in the fast cycle now, we move it, need to move it to a slow cycle where it's kept, it's stored and it's sequestered mm -hmm. and it's a tall ordeal. Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of all of those things. We, we need to do more things to just be more circular, be more efficient. That's going to take time. We need to sequester more CO2 and, and store that as well. Um, but I also think just, you know, we need to move faster back to the point of, you know, even while I'm spending time on a podcast like this, it's, I don't disagree that there are really interesting things happening out there. I, my, my disagreement is the pace, right? We're just moving far too slow. And again, I hope, and this is why I think clever carbon is interesting. If you can personalize this and people understand it, then they can do something right. Then they can actually drive some change. Um, you know, one of the things I, I tell people often is. If you want to make an impact on our oceans or even on CO2, carry a reusable water bottle and carry a grocery bag. If everyone did that, you'd eliminate a quarter of the, the plastic waste that's floating around in our oceans. Um, and But I didn't know that. I didn't know that nine months ago until I went on this journey. And so that's part of what I'm hoping to share with conversations like this with people is there are things you can do. So let's talk about those things. And if people know that, then they can actually drive change. But I think that's a big challenge I've observed. It's just, it is very overwhelming when you think about the magnitude of all the things that are in your life and, and how they impact um, things. Um, and Nick, one yeah. more, just one more note on the macro level is that, you know, carbon literacy is what we do at Clever Carbon. We try to teach people about carbon footprint in a really hip and fun way. And I know we'll get more to that, especially on an individual level. But if we have people who are not carbon literate developing solutions, how do we know it's actually a good solution? We yeah. need to know the numbers. Like if you're saying you're a carbon offset, well, how much carbon are you removing? How fast can you scale? How much is it gonna cost? These are all metrics that we need to know, but I don't see that enough today. When I talk to startups, when I talk to investors, you know, there's not a lot of carbon literate people out there and we're losing time and we need solutions that can scale in a short amount of time.